Welcome to the lecture on dimensionality reduction. The goal of dimensionality reduction is to convert high dimensional data sets to an equivalent low dimensional representation. And the first motivation is to reduce the amount of data, that's the so-called curse of dimensionality. You know, we already saw that in the classification lecture that there's a lot of combinations of the different features and a lot of dimensions and <clears throat> that can be computationally very very heavy so we want to reduce this by keeping uh, the most information um, another context application context is to visualize data for instance by projecting it down to two or three dimensions so that we can look at the data in a scatter plot and hopefully by the end of this lecture this will become much more clear um, why, why this is useful and how we can use this for the evaluation of machine learning systems. So before we do that, let's consider some intuition. And I think everybody here is familiar with photography. And what you should consider is that photography is also a means of dimensionality reduction. Like we have a 3D world. Everything on this world is 3D. And we project this down to two dimensions, right? We take a photo, it's just a grand, so there's certain things that are in front of each other that can't be seen. Um, and this is basically the idea of dimensionality reductions that we also are going to explore as part of larger data sets with at times thousands, if not millions of dimensions. And Here's a quick overview of the dimensionality reduction methods there are. There's principal component analysis. And all of you who took the math requisites of the first year should be familiar with this. You should have implemented this. There's also multidimensional scaling, MDS. There's the so-called t-distributed stochastic neighborhood embeddings. And all of them allow an analyzing large data set by projecting down data points to low dimensions, often two or three dimensions, that can then be easily visualized. Let's consider principal component analysis and revisit what we know about this. The goal of principal component analysis is to quantify the importance of either each dimension of a data set for describing the variability of the data. So PCA aims to find a new vector basis which best re-expresses a data set and which is a linear combination of the original vector bases. So yeah, and what you can see here in the figure is that exactly what's happening and what's described in the second bullet. So the goal here is to look at the data, the blue points, and what we see is that there is an increase, uh, a linear increase, and there's some variance. But the most important dimension for explaining the data, explaining the variance, the differences in the data is the what's indicated as the PCR first dimension. So that's where most difference in the data can be found. And then what you see in the PCA second dimension, that's another vector that also explains a lot of variance. Because what we see here is that the X and Y axis in the data that we had before was not so good at accounting for the differences. So we basically rotate the data set to find uh, a dimension, to, to find a representation in which the differences in the data can be explained by vectors far more easily. So we go from the x and y axis, that's our coordinate system to begin with, and we try to find a new coordinate system that's centered around 0 and 0, and that's better explaining the variance in the data. However, research showed that for high dimensional data that lies on or near low dimensional nonlinear manifold, we want to keep the low dimensional representations of very similar data points close together. But techniques like PCA or multidimensional scaling, which are based on a linear mapping, cannot achieve this as efficiently as TESNI stochastic neighborhood embeddings because PSA, PCA and MDS are focused on dissimilarities rather than similarities. 
So T distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding converts high dimensional Euclidean distances between data points into conditional probabilities that represent similarities. It's using something called the Kullback Leibler divergence, which is a measure of similarity of probability distributions. And Tesni solves the so called crowding problem. That is, when an area in a two dimensional map cannot accommodate data points that are relatively close to each other. So it's minimizing the Kullback Leibler divergence, which is a measure of uh, similarity between the joint probabilities of the high dimensional data and the low dimensional representation. So we take our data as a probability distribution, that's our high dimensional data, and then we take another probability distribution that we initialize, and then we make sure that they're similar to each other so that the same information in the high dimensional data is also contained in the low dimensional distribution. And this is what it looks like. So here we have handwritten digits that we looked at before in the other lectures. And we try to separate them just based on the pixel values. And you can see, this is colored now, that it clearly, just by taking the pixel values, it clearly is able to distinguish between these different data points based on the distribution. So this is an unsupervised technique to distinguish between the different data points. And that can then greatly help classification systems and greatly help you at understanding your data because similar things are close to each other. It's quite a powerful tool. So what we see here are images from a data set called ImageNet and they are clustered based on the activations of a neural network. We have a so-called convolutional neural network that has a, a layer FC7 with 4096 dimensions and we take these values, the activations for each of the images from the neural network and we project them down with TESNI so that similar images are close to each other. So this is this can be done for, uh, this is a subset, but can be done for all the 50,000 images in the validation data and that allows you to then uh, compare what is considered similar by the network and what is considered dissimilar. You can also resort this to make it a bit more square, but it's quite a powerful tool if you do using computer vision techniques to see how well the model captures the data. I also use something similar for my master thesis. I used word embeddings and we're going to learn about them in the natural language processing class. Uh, and here the idea is to represent each word by a vector and I projected down these vectors. And then I used this to compare different Wikipedia articles. So we have the Wikipedia article on Game of Thrones, for instance. So this is the bird's eye overview. I hope you can see it. It's an interactive tour. But what you can see here are in white the words that are in both the current revision and an old revision. And then in red, the ones that were removed and in orange, the ones that were added. And it's quite nice because, for instance, you have these clusters of place names or character names and you can see which one are added and which one get removed, for instance, between 2013 and 2015. So again, this is a technique where we have some data, we have word embeddings, and we're going again going to learn more about word embeddings in a different lecture. And we project them down. We have high dimensional word embeddings, which we project down to 2D so that we can visualize them in a way that similar words are close to each other and dissimilar words are further from each other. You can do this for other data sets. But that's it on dimensionality reduction, which you're going to use in the exercise.